Hey, good afternoon to all. My name is Maria Waltzmeyer from the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center. Welcome to today's session, Psychological First Aid, PFA for Schools. Please allow me to share some brief details about the session. Today's presenter is Felicia Walker. Felicia is a School and Student Support Services Facilitator at Johns Hopkins University. She has almost 20 years of experience in the field of education and it's well informed in the areas of school transformation, early warning systems, at risk students and dropout prevention. In her current role, she works with K through 12 staff who are developing and implementing multi-tier systems of support, including early warning systems. Today's session, will last for approximately 45 minutes and it's been recorded. We would like to encourage everyone to use the chat function at the bottom right hand corner of your screen to submit questions or comments to our presenter. Please be sure to select everyone from the drop down box to ensure that your comments and questions are seen by me and our presenters. You may submit your questions throughout the presentation and we will leave time at the end to address as many questions as possible. If we do not have time to get through all of the questions, we will reply to all participants by email within the next five to seven days. All participants have been placed on mute to avoid background noise. Please do not unmute yourself. Instead, refer to the chat function on the right side of the screen if you have a question or comment. Following the Q&A portion of our session, there will be a brief poll. Your participation in these polls is extremely important to helping us better prepare our presentations and ensure that we are delivering content to you in a way that best suits your needs. We greatly appreciate your feedback to these questions. Before I hand the session over to Felicia, I would like to remind you of the upcoming webinars that will be held in November and then also to in December. More information and the link to register for this is included on the very last slide of this presentation. I would also like to share with you the mission of the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center. The mission of the center is to disseminate evidence-based evidence practices and build and facilitate communities of practice to help students attend every day, be engaged in school and succeed academically so that they graduate from high school, prepare for college, career, and civic life. Felicia? Thank you, Maria. And thank you everyone for joining us today as we talk about the psychological first aid for schools and institutes for higher education. So today we're gonna to talk about the who, what, when, where, and how as it relates to the psychological first aid, which I'll be referencing as PFA for schools. PFA is an evidence-based performed intervention model and it supports the school and community and it's used in the immediate aftermath of tragedy. It works to reduce the initial distress caused by emergencies, disasters, and terrorism. And it allows for the expressions of difficult feelings from students and staff. It fosters the development of short and long-term adaptive functioning and coping skills. So what we're gonna look at today is the five basic standards first. And those five basic standards have to do with the consistent with research evidence base on risk and re resilience following a trauma because traumas affect different people in different ways. Respectful of and consistent with the school administration of the academic setting, school culture, and behavior of students, which we'll refer to as PFA-S. It's applicable in its practical and field settings, and it's appropriate for development across all levels as we will talk about today from K to 12, as well as college, post-secondary. And it's delivered in a culturally informed and flexible manner.
So when we look at the guiding principles that PSA is based upon, it's understanding the disaster survivors and others affected will experience a broad range of early reactions. Some of those reactions will be physical, others will be psychological, some of them will be administered through their behavior, and some of them through spiritual, just depending on how they are affected. And remembering that the stress caused by these emergencies, they will have students and staff both will have a broad range of reactions to this. So being aware that disaster survivors will have this different reactions to the different emergencies that they encounter is very important and needed as we foster students and help them through the situations. So the effects of trauma on students, it varies. And here are some of the effects that you can see. It's not only physical and mental, but there are also other feelings that come into play, such as guilt or shame over what they did or did not do at the time, and feeling like they could have helped out. Some of, some of them will have preoccupied thoughts, and those thoughts will be related to the actions if they were involved in the actual emergency themselves. And some students will feel overwhelmed, fear, and sadness. So as you can see, there's a lot of different feelings that take place that the, phys that the psychological first aid can be very useful in addressing for students. So as you can imagine, when a student goes through a traumatic event, it has a great impact on their learning. Some students have interruptions during their routine behaviors, and it also will disrupt the culture depending on when and where the actual trauma took place. A lot of students have difficulty concentrating in school, and then also that results sometimes in aggressive, reckless behavior. So it's important that we as educators are able to address the needs of these students in a timely fashion once a trauma has taken place. As you'll see on the slide, the effects for elementary school students, it ranges and it'll look different for the effects for middle and high school students, as you can see. You may notice a change in the school performance. They may have short attention spans, may not be able to concentrate, and it may also cause them to miss more days in school than normal. And sometimes the elementary school students, they will show signs of distress, and that'll be done through such things as illnesses, such as stomach aches, headaches, and, and complaining about pains that they're having. And also some students handle trauma with excessive talking and asking persistent questions about the event. So we need to be prepared and well-equipped to handle these different responses that elementary school students as well as middle and high school students may exhibit. So let's take a look at the effects on middle and high school students. As you see, it's going to be a little different from that from the elementary school level. Some effects are they're going to be self-conscious about the events, especially if they had a personal relationship with the person involved or the situation that's happening. And just like for the elementary school students, you'll see a change in their behavior and performance as well, and also possibly their attendance. And again, just as we saw in elementary school students, some of their behavior will be accident prone, it may be aggressive, and we'll need to be able to respond and react to those different signs and signals that are happening once a student goes through a traumatic experience. So when we look at the effects for college students, they're centered around intrusive reactions, avoidance, and withdrawal, and physical arousal. Very different from those of the middle and high school as well as elementary school students. So their difficulties will come when it comes to sleeping. They still won't be able to concentrate. They'll be irritable and jumpy. And then sometimes they'll try to avoid places or people or things associated with the traumatic event. And they may also feel emotionally numb 
or detached from a situation or a place, depending on where the traumatic event took place. And they also may show a loss in interest for things that they usually enjoy participating and being a part of. So as you can see, the reactions across the board are very different and unique as we move up to different levels. Following an emergency, PFAS is most effective immediately. And this is sometimes maybe one hour to a couple of weeks after an event, depending on when the event took place. And PFAS can be initiated while an event is still occurring, such as in shelter in place or lockdown situations. So even though the event is taking place, you can also practice PFA during that time as well. And here you can see the different steps that are outlined. So it includes a basic information gathering technique, rapid assessment of survivors' immediate concerns and needs, and then it puts forth supportive activities in a flexible manner. So a lot of things are moving at a fast pace during this time, and it's very important that staff become trained and well-equipped to handle traumatic experiences. So how do you go about using PFSA, and who can provide the aspects of it? Any staff member, regardless of whether he or she has had mental health training, can deliver aspects of PFSA and PFA students. Trained members of community emergency responses agencies and mental health professionals may also assist with PFSA. During and after an emergency, teachers and other staff are a critical link in promoting resilience and in recognizing the signs of traumatic stress and in helping students and their families regain a sense of normalcy. A lot of times the teachers are the first and the last in some instances touch of the students who are experiencing that traumatic experience if it happens in or during school hours. So let's take a look at some of the basic objectives of PSA. It's better to respond to emergencies that disrupt the learning environment so you can quickly get things back on track and help students to respond and to also implement coping skills. So what you want to do during this place is you want to enhance immediate and ongoing safety. You want to make sure that you keep calm and keep the students calm and oriented. And when when able, you would also want to keep the students on task. Also, there should be a time that provides social support and those kind of networks that students may need to be in contact with. And there's a lot of other different basic objectives that you can take into consideration when you're going through the PSA. Why should PSA be provided in schools? There's a couple of different reasons that you'll see listed here. And it's extremely important because schools are typically the first service agency to resume operations after a disaster or emergency. And this makes preparing for emergencies critical for all staff. They may be needed to provide brief interventions for short-term support. And students will need the leadership and guidance from the staff. So let's take a look at the five preparedness missions. There's prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And all of these have to do with what you're doing before, during, and after that traumatic experience. And a lot of times you're gonna need rapid and coordinated responses to help orient things and to keep everyone calm in a traumatic situation. So here's an overview of the six steps of PSSA. And one of those uh, includes developing an EOP or emergency operation plan. And that's important so you'll already have a process and procedure in place which you can rely on that's already been pre-shared with staff and they are aware on how to react and how to respond in a traumatic or emergency experience. 
So we're going to briefly go through the steps as you see them on the slides. So the step one is form a collaborative planning team. And that's where you can start to develop that EOP, Emergency Operations Plans. And then you want to understand the situation, identify any threats and hazards, assess all risk, and prior prioritize threats and hazards. And next, you would like to determine goals and objectives. You want to develop those goals and develop those objectives together as a team. Plan your development. And then also plan, prepare, review, and get approval for that uh, plan that you're going to be writing. So you're writing the plan, you review the plan, and then it is approved and it's shared. And then finally, you're going to train the stakeholders to exercise the plan and review and revise as needed and maintain the plan and keep it up to date. There's a couple of ways that you can prepare to deliver PFFA in reference to students. What you want to do is coordinate in advance with the appropriate school officials, whether that involves outside agencies and others in the community. You want to make sure that you coordinate in advance so they are also aware of what that plan looks like. You want to learn about the school community to see who in the community would you be contacting during an emergency or traumatic situation. You want to identify the distinguishing features of the event, beware of at-risk populations during the event, and be sensitive and to racial and cultural diversity. And then you also want to adapt for students with disabilities and other functional and access needs. So it's a lot that's going into preparing to deliver the PFA for students. So one of those ways that it can be delivered is during a school assembly. During a school assembly, you're gathering students together and uh, this is very beneficial if it's done usually early in the day if possible. And some of the things that you want to discuss is you want to provide information about the event, describe the available resources, give psychoeducation and potential reactions, and describe the basic elements of PSAS, then apply techniques in smaller follow-up groups. So once you're addressing the school as a whole, you also want staff to be trained to address those smaller groups of students when they go back into the classrooms. So some of the things that you would want to be aware of in the classroom, when students have experienced a common disaster or emergency, provide discussions about resources available. Even though they're shared, they may have been shared during an assembly, reinforcement of those resources that are available during the classroom time may be understood more by students, and then they also have a chance to ask questions or to get more information about the available resources. And you also want to focus on problem-solving strategies, if appropriate. And one thing that's important is in the classroom is a great time to talk about and discuss coping skills, depending on what the traumatic or emergency is that has taken place. So in this scenario, where a school shooting took place at a high school, there was a, an emergency that happened, and some of the key teaching points that was brought up about after this incident was the impact of school violence and the guidelines for school-based intervention, and also some of the goals of the classroom intervention as well. And so it's not, you don't want to react to the situation once it has occurred. You don't want to wait, but you want to be preactive and react before it actually happens, being proactive and not reactive. Another way to deliver PFAS is in small groups. And this could be with students and staff with varied experiences. So you would want to introduce and structure the group by saying things that you understand that people experience different feelings and reactions during the traumatic experience, and you also want to make sure to explain its purpose. 
and any resources that you have available would be a good time to share then, and also focusing on coping skills again as well. And you want to make sure that you always explain the purpose of why you're meeting with the smaller group. So for example, you may want to say, today we want each of you to leave the group with some specific tools to help you cope with these intense feelings and thoughts. Also, we will update you on what has been happening and what support services are available. It is common for people in a group like this to feel emotion or need to take a break. So what you're doing is you're you're sort of de-escalating the situation and helping students to respond to those emotions that they may be going through or they, they may be experiencing. So you want to make them feel relaxed, feel comfortable, and feel as if everything is under control. And then you also want to make sure that they are aware that they can come back and discuss any issues or concerns that they have at a later time. So what we're going to look at now is some of the core actions for PFAS for students. Core action number one is contact and engagement. You want to provide leadership and be visible to the school community because the students are going to need your leadership and guidance during this time. You want to reach out to those that are afflicted, including family members, and consider consultation from disaster mental health experts if the situation warrants that. Core action number two is going to deal with safety and comfort. You want to provide regular updates because everyone's going to be wanting to know what's happening, what's going on, and what are the updates. You want to assess and always address the identified safety concerns and make sure that you consider having a threat assessment team so they can be ready to react to those safety concerns in those situations. You want to definitely limit the media access until the situation is under control and also help manage any grief that may be a result of the trauma or emergency that has occurred. Core action three is stabilization. You want to stabilize the environment as much as possible and try to keep students on task when you are able to do that. Identify any students that may be at risk and remind students of the fact that you're working on the situation and keeping them updated on what's going on. Core action four deals with information gathering. You want to become fully informed about the incident and those who are affected and actively reach out to those students. And that's where you may have to do small groups or even some classroom gatherings and discussions about uh, what's going on, coping skills, and also resources available. Core action number five is practical assistance. You want to coordinate any donations and coordinate any volunteers. And this is usually going to take place after the situation has occurred. And the sooner that that can take place, the better, depending on the situation. Core action six is a connection with social supports. You want to integrate any new students that may be at the school and have gone through uh, the traumatic experience, and you want to establish peer-to-peer -peer programs so that students can support each other. And you always want to maintain school community connections because sometimes for those resources, you're going to have to use external uh, community stakeholders to come in and be a part to handle the trauma or the emergency that's happened. Core action number seven is on information on coping. So you're going to provide psychoeducation and information for students, and you're also going to provide different problem-solving situations to address students' needs and concerns. You want to promote your school as an environment for recovery and maintain campus, school, and academic routines. So you want to op operate as business as usual, as much as you possibly can. And core action number eight is link with collaborative service. You want to activate mutual aid ag agreements and seek and apply for technical assistance and or funding if the situation warrants itself. So with all of those actions, you're going to be doing a lot of different things, but here is a way for you to actually address and handle 
the emergency situations or trauma experiences that may take place on a campus, outside of a campus, in a neighborhood. And this also applies to any national headlines that could have an interruption or an impact in the learning environment. So what I would like to do, I hope you have found this information informative and maybe thinking about how important it is for your school to be able to use the psychological first aid just in case your students and or staff are faced with a disaster or an emergency. I have the privilege today to be joined by Hamed Negron Perez, Program Specialist from the United States Department of Education, Office of Safe and Healthy Schools. He is here to provide additional comments and to answer any questions that you may have. So please type your questions into the chat box if you have not already done so. And I'll turn things over back to Maria. Um, I don't see anything on the queue yet. But I'm going to check with Diane. Do you see anything, Diane? Hi, nothing's come in over here. Okay, wait, I have one on Q&A. Okay. So here goes the question, where would school leaders go to access psychoeducation and information that could be shared with faculty and staff? Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is Ahmed. Um, and that's exactly a, <laughs> that's a perfect slide. Um, there's um, um, the national organizations that you can see, and also if you want to go in the direction of getting psychological first aid or teacher resilience for faculty and staff to kind of train them and help them kind of address their own issues, because we all know, um, me being a, a recovering high school principal, you know that your teachers are, you know, kind of that Superman complex. These are my kids and I will take care of them. So one of the things that happens is they start to experience compassion fatigue and the need for this. So if you go to rems.ed.gov, um, there's actually a training, um, training and train the trainer former that you could have them come to your school and train your faculty and staff to kind of help you deal with that. So. The above ones are really good as far as resources and kind of resource packets and information and tools. And then the rems.e.gov is a good one to request training. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, so here I have another question. How would core action two, safety and comfort, be implemented for an ongoing trauma for example, the constant fear of ICE immigration rates as it is happening in South and Central Texas as well as Denver, Colorado. Um, I can step in unless Felicia has something. Take it away. Cool. Um, well, one of the things to think about when you look at the core, you know, those core steps, is that it's not necessarily linear. It could be cyclical. So when you establish that safe environment, you kind of do that every single time you want to meet with these students and create and kind of that safe place. Because um, you're right, as far as the circumstances happening outside the school are going to continue to be in flux. And new incidents or reminders of old incidents that could cause re-traumatization, you know, what you can control is when you have this intervention, when you have them in a space, create that safe environment there. Because, you know, we're kind of limited to that reach out. So just keep that in mind that you can go through one core step to the second, third, and have to go back to the second one. Or every time you do an intervention, you kind of start from that. So, but just, just keep that in mind. Great, thank you. So at this point, I don't see any other questions um, in the queue. So we are going to move um, to uh, the polling. Oh, there's additional resources that are showing right now. Oh, can I talk a little bit about those? Could of you go course, back to slide? Please. By all means. All right. Um, one of the things that, that you're going to notice in the presentation, and we're, of course you're going to have access to this later, is when we're talking about um, developing emergency operations plan, 
is that one of the things that you should, as a school, be it at the administrative level or at the district level, you want to be thinking about incorporating this approach, you know, your psychological first aid approach for students and staff into your emergency operations plan. So it's kind of like if you go back to that slide that had the six steps, you, you kind of want to have everybody at the table that it's going to be involved with the different aspects of your school. And when you're talking about emergency, it's all about all hazards. And we know that a traumatic, a traumatic incident could be a hazard, could be something that's going to cause ripple effects, not just with the mental health of your students, but also with their academic performance. So you want to make sure all these things are incorporated into that EOP, that emergency operations plan. So don't think of it as solely based on natural disasters, which needs to be there, of course, but it encompasses your entire school's climate and the things that are around it. So when you look at those steps, when you revisit that and you look at this presentation, and you can go to these links and actually download the guide and there's resources and a bunch of stuff as far as to create your own, evaluate the current one you have. But to think about how can I put this in a plan so if there is teacher turnover, if there is kind of new incidents happening, you have a plan in place that will address it. And that goes back to the before, during, and after in the sense that while you're in the middle of the incident recovering, you really don't have time to think about this. So the time to do it is now, before the incident happens and incorporated into that plan. So this is kind of a, I know it's a lot, but it's a kind of an offshoot of the psychological first aid and how it fits into your, a bigger system for your school. Thanks. All righty, so we are now um, um, going to the polling, um, and we would like to encourage everyone to participate in a few, a few quick polling questions related to this session. Your responses are completely anonymous, so please answer honestly and help us find ways to improve our approach and content offerings in the future. We sincerely appreciate your feedback. What you're also, while you're answering your um, polling questions, I also want to um, note that on the screen right now are the upcoming uh, webinars. Um, one will be in November and then uh, two other ones in December. We thank you so much for attending today's session. I also would like to thank our presenters for their insight and expertise. We hope that you found this session helpful and informative, and we hope to see you again at a future National Center event. Thank you.